And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them at the inn. So that is probably one of the most famous passages ever written. It's from the Gospel according to St. Luke, which was probably written at the end of the first century AD. And it, of course, describes the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, Tom, we have just finished our World Cup marathon. We are resuming normal service, and we're resuming normal service just before Christmas with arguably the greatest, the most bewildering, the most mysterious historical subject of all, which is the life of Jesus. Um, and this is something that was voted for, wasn't it, by listeners to the Rest is History Club? Yes, about a year ago. Yes. And you've been dreading it ever since. <laughs> well, no, I haven't been dreading it, but I wanted to do it justice because, as you say, it is um, – I mean, it's a, Jesus is, to put it mildly, a very famous historical figure. And it, it's an incredibly complex subject because yeah. it is a subject that touches on theology as well as history. Uh -huh. And that makes it complicated. Um, because obviously the issue of who Jesus was, uh, what he might have taught, what happened to him, even the question of whether he existed, which some have, have doubted, is a topic of huge sensitivity for believers, for people yeah. who believe that this person was the son of God, was simultaneously human and divine, but also I think for people who are militantly opposed to uh, belief in God. And who therefore yeah. would very much like to, to, to believe that he say he didn't exist at the most extreme wing. And so it provokes faith responses, both from believers and from non-believers. And the challenge, therefore, is to try and kind of steer your way between that, the Scylla and Charybdis of those two opposing positions. Understood. But of course, it's hopeless because I, 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 I think it's impossible to be raised in a, a, a fundamentally Christian society uh, as we have been and not have perspectives on this that yeah. in so many ways are alien to the world that Jesus was born into. But the, that is the challenge, is to try and get some sense of what do the, what, you know, what are, what do the sources tell us and what are the kind, what's the kind of broader context that might make, yeah. you know, provide, give us some chance to kind of arrive at a sense of what he might but have But people been. have been doing this for 300 years, Tom, haven't they? They've been trying to um, unpick the sources to make sense of Jesus as a historical figure. I mean... I guess every, almost everybody listening to this podcast, I'm assuming everybody will know the outline of the story. Born in a manger, wise men, uh, all of this stuff. Then a bit of a blank, and then entering Jerusalem. Well, ba baptized, by, baptized by, by a figure called John the Baptist. Yeah. Uh, tells parables, teaches, yeah. um, all that kind of stuff. Casting out demons. Yeah. Casting out demons. Uh, enters Jerusalem, um, overthrows the moneylenders in the temple. Um, arrested by uh, the soldiers of the high priest, uh, delivered over to Pilate, the prefect of Judea. Yeah. He's crucified. And then according to Christians, he rises from the dead. So we are talking, I mean, we, we, we really are talking, I guess, aren't we, about the single most, if, if Jesus did exist, he is the single best known person who has ever existed. People use his name without thinking about it. Every, they must use it every minute on this planet, you know, as a, as a expression of, 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 of exasperation, of outrage, or as a prayer, or as an invocation, or whatever. I think, I mean, I think his only rival would be Muhammad, and I would put Jesus ahead of Muhammad in the, the fame stakes, simply because Jesus is also a figure in the Quran. But I, I compare, I think the comparison is often made between Jesus and Muhammad, but I think actually the comparison that is much more germane is between Jesus and the Quran, because both Christianity and Islam have at their heart, the idea that the divine 
entered the world. So mm -hmm. for Muslims, the Quran is the word of God. And for Christians, Jesus is, he is, God, he is God, the son. Yeah. And so for the historian, that means that there's a kind of molten core of the weird, of the supernatural, of the strange, of the inexplicable at the beginnings of both those stories that I think has been fundamental to I explaining the impact that both those great traditions have had, Christianity and Islam. And just to look at Islam first, at no point do we have any record of anyone in the Muslim tradition doubting that the Quran is the word of God. That seems to be absolutely fundamental to Muslim identity right from the very beginning. Yeah. The problem for the historian is that the only account we have of how the Quran comes into being is the Muslim account that is written a couple of centuries later. Uh -huh. So in a sense, it, it's, it's basically impossible, I think, for historians to get back to the, the mystery of how the Quran came into being and how people came to think that it was the word of God. You just, in a sense, you have to take it as read that that is what people believed. Likewise, with the Christian tradition, the idea that there was something fundamentally strange about the figure of Jesus and of course, it's focused on the idea that he's, he's raised from the dead, but I don't think that's adequate to explain the incredibly elevated status that he seems to have been awarded by Christians pretty much from the beginning. What is it about him? What is it yeah. about this figure that, that, that leads him to, to, to be cast as part of the, the omnipotent uh, eternal Godhead? This sense that there is a, a weirdness at the core of the story is part of what makes the analysis of this story so so difficult. But I think it's also kind of brilliant because it is a way of taking us back into the ancient world where there was no real division between the natural and the supernatural. There is no concept of the secular. There is no concept that um, the divine can be separated out from the dimension yeah. of the mortal. And so I think even the most secular skeptical historian has to in a sense, find a, a place in their analysis for the strangeness and the weirdness that has, for 2000 years, has underlain Christian faith. So what we're going to do, Tom, we're doing two episodes, aren't we? The mystery and and then the history or the history and the mystery. Yeah, brilliant. Quite decided brilliant. How we're gonna, um, <laughs> and I guess, so, I mean, we're going to look at the context. We're going to look at the sources. We're going to try and reconstruct or you're going to try and reconstruct with me also present you're going to try and reconstruct as best we can yeah what some sense of the historic the historical figure of jesus but just for those people who don't really know more than two thousand years ago we we're in the eastern mediterranean we did a, a few podcasts didn't we? we did a series about the life of cleopatra yeah. So we're in the, we're a generation after that, and we also did two on um, the Judean the, the the Judean revolt. So it's it's between Cleopatra and the Judean revolt. So the basically. first character we mentioned in this episode was Caesar Augustus. So the Roman Empire has, as it were, begun. Uh, Augustus has it's a, it's his it's his Pax Romana, isn't it? It's his he has put an end to the civil wars. It's a period of, peace, of relative peace and stability, and it's in this context that this man, if he is a man, um, is born, lives, and dies at the turn of the what are we? What are we, the turn of the first century AD? I, I suppose. But but Dominic, I mean that's yes. that's that's a, that's an absolutely kind of ringy example of the difficulty of treating Jesus just like any other historical figure. Go on. Is that of course he? You know his 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 birth defines our dating system. Yeah. So it's kind of, you know, it's even though, as we'll see, he seems not to have been born in 1 AD or, right, or not. 1 BC no or whatever. Is there, yeah. there is no yeah. naught. And I think a further, you know, so, so, so that is, is why Jesus is, has always seen, been seen as a complicated figure for historians to grapple with, is that he is also a theological figure. And so mm -hmm. you mentioned how for the past 300 years, really, people have been trying to kind of strip away the cladding of, of theology. But it's often yeah. theologians who do this. So I guess the first guy who did this was a, was a, a German scholar called Rimarus, who in the 18th century, in the kind of the heyday of the Enlightenment, he cast Jesus as, um, as a pretty orthodox Jew who kind of descended from, uh, you know, the hill country and aspired to uh, become the kind of the worldly deliverer of Israel. 
So it's this idea that he is a rebel of a kind that in due course will lead to the destruction of Jerusalem. Yeah. Um, then you, then in the, the 19th century, you have various explanations. You have a, again, a German, Germans are popping up all over the place in this tradition. Um, and he's rejecting all this kind of supernatural stuff as a simple kind of mythical cladding. Uh-huh. It's, it's kind of mythical elaborations. Yeah. You have a Frenchman called Ernest Renan, also in the nineteenth oh, yes. century, who who he's he's supplying kind of psychological explanations for it. So again, that's been a very popular tradition. And then at the beginning of the twentieth century, you have a guy called Albert Schweitzer, very kind of eminent, distinguished figure, um, not just as a, a theologian, and he casts Jesus as an apocalyptic prophet. And what all these traditions have is that they're trying to de-theologize Jesus. Right. So they're basically saying he's not a supernatural figure. He's a man, and you know this yeah. is what he actually was. But I were. think, for what it's worth, that actually you have to keep a sense of the weirdness because otherwise you're not getting back properly into the cast of mind of the world that he's born into. And it's not just Palestine. It's not just Judea and Galilee mm-hmm. where this is current. It's across the empire. And when you look at the at what is happening in the first century AD across the entire span of Rome's provinces, Jesus doesn't actually seem that strange a figure. So I just I just want to read you a passage from Tacitus, who is writing about the year of the four emperors, AD 69. And he's describing Vitellius, um, man who loved his pies, yeah. one of the four emperors. And he's he's arrived in uh, in Lyon. And Tacitus describes there a certain Maricus, who is a Gaul, uh, from the tribe of the Boi, uh, who boldly endeavoured to thrust himself into greatness and to challenge the armies of Rome, pretending to be divine. This champion of Gaul and God, as he had entitled himself, had already gathered a force of 8,000 men. Um, and Tacitus describes how he's starting to whip up a revolt. But he gets uh, arrested, he gets brought uh, before Vitellius, um, and he gets thrown to wild beasts. And then Tacitus says, as they refused to devour him, the common people stupidly believed him invulnerable until he was executed in the presence of Vitellius. So we know nothing more about this guy, Maricus, yes. but he's claiming to be a god. Uh, people believe that he can't be put to death, that he somehow triumphed over uh, the apparatus of the Roman state. And this is just one of a kind of multitude of rebellions that are happening throughout this period. There's a German prophetess in a tower who likewise is thought by her followers to be divine. There's the Druids in Britain who get slaughtered because, again, they are seen as kind of uh, people who can channel a divine power that is seen by the Romans as somehow threatening. And so Jesus is in this, you know, looked at in the broader sense. He is a figure who is put to death by the Romans as king of the Jews, as a rebel against yeah. Roman power and who claims some kind of divine authority. So in that sense, you know, he's not so unusual. Right. So and, and that bloke you described in Tacitus. So. We know that bloke existed, or, or we assume he did, because we don't think Tacitus is lying. Well, we, why would we have any um, reason not to think that? Right, exactly. So that raises the question, Jesus. So there will be some people listening to this podcast who will have started listening, thinking, and saying to themselves, well, this is a strange subject for a history podcast, because I don't believe Jesus did exist. I think I don't, I'm not a Christian. I think it's all invented. You know, maybe it's invented by St. Paul later on. Um you know, the, the great sort of, uh, proselytizer of Christianity. Maybe it's been cooked up by the Romans, you know, the Catholic Church, blah, 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 blah. But Jesus is all a bit of a fiction and a fairy tale. But Tom, I think it's fair to say that you don't think that, do you? I don't think any, any historian thinks that. I don't think any credible historian thinks that. And the reason for that is that unlike Maricus in uh, Gaul, we have quite a detail well not i mean by the standards of ancient history we have a very very detailed understanding of what is going on in judea in galilee at this period in the first century ad yeah and you know by the standards of ancient history we actually know an enormous amount about the world into which jesus is born and i know you love a discussion of sources (laughs) i I dread a discussion (laughs) of sources tom i can hear people switching off but i think i think in this in this context it is it's worth looking at I think it's worth looking both at the references to Jesus per se, yeah. but also the much broader context that enables us to have a sense of the world into which he's born. So the references to Jesus, we have this one reference to Maricus. Uh-huh. We have quite a lot of references. I mean, considering that Jesus is a, a, a guy, you know, a provincial who gets crucified, we have quite a few. So admittedly, some of them are quite 
problematic. Some of them aren't absolutely certain, but there's a kind of haze there. So the, the, the first, the, as far as we know, the earliest one is, is by Josephus, who we talked about in the context of the Judean revolt. And G- yeah. Josephus is the key figure for enabling us to have a sense of what, of, of, of how accurate the gospels are and to what extent Jesus is a historical figure. So remind people who, who is, who is Josephus? Josephus is a, a, a Judean who is brought up in Jerusalem very well educated. He's from the, the the priestly class that basically have responsibility from the Romans for administering Jerusalem. Um, he joins the revolt against the Romans in the late 60s. He gets captured. He persuades Vespasian, the commander of the Romans, against the Judeans, who goes on to become emperor, that he is going to become emperor. And so he ends up a Roman citizen, and he writes an account of the Judean War, and then he writes a very, very long account history of of, um, of the Judeans. And it's in this later account that he seems to mention, uh, well, he mentions kind of various figures who appear in the New Testament. So he mentions John the Baptist. Right. So John the Baptist clearly seems to be a historical figure. He describes how John is put to death, all that kind of stuff, although he doesn't link him to Jesus. So there's no hint of the Christian tradition that uh, John the Baptist um, baptizes Jesus. So for people who don't know, John the Baptist is uh, well, we'll he's, pre- he's we'll a forerunner yeah. of Jesus who goes. Well, I, yeah. I mean, this is unbelievably simplistic. He goes around baptizing people. <laughs> uh, yes, a little bit more than that, but yes, ba- yeah. that's ba- that's basically his thing. Um, and then there's a very notorious passage which seems to mention Jesus himself. Uh, Josephus is describing all the events that happen in uh, Pilate's period of office in Judea. And so he describes all the various things that Pilate does, how he introduces imperial images into Jerusalem. So images of Caesar, which yeah. you know, doesn't go down well, how he expropriates temple funds to build an aqueduct. And then he comes to Jesus and his followers. And the passage as we have it is, is as follows. About this time comes Jesus, a wise man, if indeed it is proper to call him a man. For he was a worker of incredible deeds, a teacher of those who accept the truth with pleasure. And he attracts many Judeans as well as many who live like Greeks. This man was the Christ. And when in view of his denunciation by the leading men among us, Pilate had sentenced him to a cross. Those who had loved him at the beginning did not cease to do so. He appeared to them on the third day alive again, for the divine prophets had announced these and countless other marvels concerning him. And even now the tribe of the Christians named after him has not yet disappeared. Now, this is definitely ornamented. You know, this man was the Christ, i.e. this man was the Messiah. Josephus wouldn't have written that. We know for a fact that Josephus did not write that because Origen, who is a church father in the early third century AD, flatly says that Josephus did not think Jesus was the Messiah. So this has definitely, definitely been elaborated. And so there are some who say that it, it's completely fake. So when you say elaborated, do you mean it's been altered by Christians later on? I, I mean, it's definitely been written up by by Christians, but the, the issue is, was it, you know, was there a kind of core at the beginning? And I think that Probably the balance of, of, of consensus is that there was a, you know, there's a kernel that then got written up. So uh, there's a biblical scholar called John P. Mayer, and he's offered his version. At this time, there appeared Jesus, a wise man, for he was a doer of startling deeds, a teacher of people who received the truth with pleasure. He gained a following both among Jews and of Greeks. And when Pilate, because of an accusation made by the leading men among us, condemned him to the cross, those who loved him previously did not cease to do so. And up until this very day, the tribe of Christians named after him has not died out. So basically, all the kind of theological Christian stuff has been purged, and you perhaps have a hard core. I mean, we don't know because right. we have no, and I'm afraid that throughout this podcast, there's going to be a lot of, we don't know. Oh, it's very frustrating. But I would say that, that the balance of probability is, is that Josephus probably does mention him. And, and the reason for that is that he also mentions Jesus's brother, James, who gets put to death by a, an amusingly named high priest called an, an, an anus. <laughs> an anus. Um, an anus. <laughs> right. And, and the reason why this is telling is that it's a very offhand reference. So Josephus describes James as the brother of Jesus, the so-called Christ, the so-called Messiah. Right. And it's a throwaway comment. The focus yeah. isn't James. The focus isn't Jesus. It's a description about how Ananus is a, a, a kind of tyrannical figure. Um, so that suggests that actually Jesus probably has been mentioned earlier by Josephus in his, in his narrative. Yeah. So we've got that. Josephus also provides very detailed account of the functioning of Judea and Galilee in this period. And we'll come to exactly what it is that he says later right. on. If we're carrying on looking at the, all the various stuff that, that we get. 
in in the in the the uh, the non-Christian sources, there is a letter written by a philosopher in Syria by the, ma- the name of Mara Bar Serapion. He he refers to a man whom he describes as the wise king of the Jews, who's compared to Socrates and Pythagoras as noble, wise people who were put to death um, unjustly, and this brought down disaster. And he he refers that it's because the Judeans put Jesus to death if it is Jesus, the, the wise king, that their temple has been destroyed and they've been dispersed. Does he call him Jesus? No, he doesn't. He doesn't. Okay. And the other thing is, is we don't exactly know when he wrote this. So uh, Fergus Miller, who's very, very, very distinguished, I mean, uber distinguished classicist, dates it to just after the sack of Jerusalem. So that's kind of the 70s, something like that. Okay. But others say that it's probably later, that it's probably around the time of Hadrian. And just to be clear, we think Jesus, if he, insofar as he existed, would have died in the early 30s, yeah. mid 30s AD. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, so that's been adduced as a, an early reference. Then we have Pliny the Younger. Your favourite, yeah. No, my, my favourite is Pliny the Elder, oh. the encyclopedist, but this is okay. his nephew. Okay. Um, and he gets sent by Trajan to become governor of uh, Bithynia and Pontus, which is basically the north of what's now Turkey. Yep. joining the Black Sea. And he writes to Trajan in the autumn of AD 112, and he, he says that he's come across Christians. And he describes it as a, a, a superstition, as a kind of disease that's spreading out of control. So now we're almost 100 years on, though, Tom. We are about 80 years on from the death yeah. of Jesus at this point. Um, and he says that it's their custom to meet on a fixed day before dawn and sing a hymn to Christ as though he were a god and to bind themselves by oath not to criminality, but never to commit fraud, theft, or adultery. Around the same time, so perhaps 120, 125, maybe even 130, so pretty much a century after the death of Jesus, yeah. we have Tacitus, who we've, I've already mentioned, great historian, and he writes about ne- the reign of Nero and how after the, the great fire, Nero blames people who are called Christians, a sect detested for their abominations, and Tacitus doesn't, doesn't call the founder of this sect Jesus, he calls him Christus, so he seems to right. assume that Christus, you know, the Messiah, the anointed one. That's his name. So Christus, just to be clear, Christus is Greek. Is that it's right? Greek. Yeah. It means anointed one, the Messiah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And he says that it, he, Christus died uh, under, under Tiberius, under Pontius Pilate, uh, that it's a terror, again, echoing Pliny, that it's a terrible superstition, that it's hideous, that it's shameful. So that's a definite illusion. I mean, they're yeah. kind of, you know, there are... You can find attempts to argue that this isn't authentic, but I think pretty much everyone accepts it's authentic. I suppose the problem that some listeners will have thought of immediately is this is almost 100 years afterwards. Yep, so it's a absolutely. bit like uh, you are only source for the life of David Lloyd George or Woodrow Wilson or the Kaiser is written now in 2022. And a lot of people would say that's very unreliable. Yes, it is a problem. And and the other problem, and we also have Suetonius, who all, the, the biographer of the 12 Caesars, who mentions somebody called Crestus, who he says in the reign of Claudius had, is whipping the Jews in Rome into a state of, of, of chronic state of disorder. Yeah. Uh, this Crestus seems to be alive at the time when uh, Suetonius is referring to him. So again, much debate as to whether this is reference to Jesus. He also references him in the, the context of the great fire. Now, so, so, so all those references that aside from uh, Josephus, pretty much all those references seem to derive from the Christians themselves. So they're not, it's not like they are deriving from, oh, I don't know, Pontius Pilate's provincial report or something like that. These are reporting what Christians themselves believe. So yeah. in that sense, if you want to believe that Jesus didn't exist, I would say they're not conclusive. But I was about to say, Tom, this issue about the chronology, about the sources being being later. I mean, when I think about some of the podcasts we've done this year or in the last you know, couple of years. So we did a series about the life of Alexander the Great and a series about the life yeah. of Cleopatra. This is an excellent opportunity, of course, for me to advertise my own children's books. Christmas is coming. Christmas is coming and yeah. your children and other people's children will thank you for it. However, that aside... Um, Alexander, let's say, all the sources are much later and are con- conforming to literary formulas and of copying one another and all of this sort of thing. But we don't doubt that Alexander the Great lived and died. We don't doubt a lot of the details of the story. So is Jesus different? I mean, I suppose the references are much more fleeting and are much more obscure, aren't they? He is an obscure figure. So the, the significance that is given to him is given to him by his followers. 
Alexander is palpably an earth-shaking figure who is remembered centuries and centuries after he lived. That's why he's remembered. But I think you've, you absolutely fix on the salient point about this whole issue, which is that this is a problem with everybody in ancient history. This is the constant, constant challenge, is that often you, you have fragments of detail or you have biographies that are written long after that are shot through with all kinds of fantastical elements. Nero, let's say. I mean, Nero, we talk, Nero, talk yes, Nero absolutely. Yes, Nero. Exactly. Exactly so. So the challenge is, is to look at the overt references that, that we have and then to try and place them in the context of the more detailed sources. So in the case of Jesus, that would be the New Testament. But before you can do that, you want to look and see what, what is the world that this figure is born into? And how does that then merge? How does that correspond to the evidence that we're getting, say, in the Gospels? So what can we say about Judea? What can we say about Galilee? And how does that then correspond to what we get in the New Testament? And right. then what does that imply for the figure of Jesus, the likelihood that he said what he said, that he existed as the, as the Gospel writers claim? And And that, I think, is not in any way an unusual challenge for an ancient historian to face. It's Perfect. absolute bread and butter. So I think we should take a break now and then come back and look at the context. What, what do we know about Galilee and Judea, the yes. world of Jesus? The world of Jesus is coming after the break. Don't go away. Welcome back to The Rest is History, or as I like to think of it, my own private kingdom of heaven. Tom, you are guiding us through the world of Jesus. Very exciting. Um, so before the break, you were talking about the complexities of the sources and all that sort of stuff. And now you're going to tell us about, well, tell us about the world in which this character is born. So the salient thing about, about um, let's call it Palestine in this period, is that its administration is incredibly complicated. And we can have some sense of what is going on, thanks to Josephus, who, who describes its evolution in some detail. But basically, you will remember from writing about Cleopatra, Cleopatra is, a, is essentially a Roman client queen. Yes. And this is pretty much how the Romans like to administer large swathes of their, the, the eastern half of their empire. And the, of course, the famous Judean client king is Herod the Great. Who Cleopatra hated. They got him very badly, didn't they? But he got, he kind of sucked up to Augustus, despite having previously backed Antony. <laughs> yes. Uh, and, and, you know, he gets away with it. And his sons, w when he dies, his kingdom gets divided up um, between his three sons. And um, a guy called uh, Archelaus, he, he, he gets given Judea. Uh, and Judea is basically, it's, J Jerusalem is its capital and it's the kind of the region around it. And then to the north of it, there's a region called Galilee. Yeah. And this gets awarded to, to um, a son of Herod, Herod Antipas. And he rules, you know, he has a very, very long life. So he rules from basically 4 BC up to AD 39. And this is in contrast to Archelaus, who proves to be spectacularly incompetent and gets deposed by the Romans. And this is when Judea comes under direct Roman rule. Okay. This is the background to the census that is ordered when Cyrenaeus is governor that you mentioned in the opening passage from Luke. Yeah. So this is what's going on. It, that census is a marker of the imposition of direct Roman rule. And just to be clear, so uh, going back to that first reading, so Nazareth, where Joseph and Mary are from, yeah. that's in Galilee. Yes. But Joseph has to go back to Bethlehem, or the story says he goes back to Bethlehem, right. which is in Judea, near Jerusalem. So this is the, the, the key problem, I think, is that we attempted to describe Judeans as Jews. And so we, because we have a sense today of what a Jew is, it's somebody who is defined by what we would call a religion, yeah. as well as by um, ethnicity. You have this idea that the Jews are somehow unusual in the context of the Roman world. I mean, they are seen as unusual, but everybody is seen by the Romans as unusual. All provincials are seen as kind of weird and mad in some way. It's much, much better to think of Jews as Judeans. Yeah. Just as, you know, Greeks are people who live in Greece, but they are also people who, who kind of buy into Greek civilization. So somebody who lives in Alexandria in Egypt might be a Greek. Right. So likewise, a Judean can simultaneously be someone who lives in the province of Judea, and that is invariably, you know, that again and again, that is how they are referred to in the Gospels. So when in the Gospels you read Jews, 
you should think actually Judeans. And what do they mean by Judeans? Do they mean you know anyone who is a Judean, or do they mean specifically people who are in the province, the Roman province of Judea? So that's that's a kind of key thing to bear in mind. And the corollary of that is that Jesus is a Judean in the sense that you know his his he, he's descended from Judeans that he he goes to synagogues that he worships a Judean God, but in another sense he's not a Judean because he's not a subject he's not a Roman subject he's a subject of a client king he's a Galilean in Galilee yeah so when people call him Jesus of Nazareth that's yeah that's in Galilee that's not that a is in Galilee and it's an incredibly obscure place and it's a place so obscure that it would be very hard to know why anyone would make that up yeah I mean there's no conceivable benefit for anyone. In, in, in saying that he comes from, from Nazareth. And so he's not subject, for instance, to Roman taxes. There are not Roman legionaries tramping around all over the place. What there are, are kind of cities that are more Greek than they're Judean. And these have been planted by Herod Antipas. These are the, you know, the centers of, of his power, urban centers. But, but Jesus in the gospels very notably does not go to these places. So Nazareth is a, a, a couple of hours walk from a place called Sepphoris one of the great Greek cities of the region. Yeah. But apart from one variant reading in a 10th century manuscript, I think of John, there is no mention of Sepphoris in the Gospels. So it's a really, really telling absence. So Nazareth is a kind of rural hinterland, is it? It's kind of a fly bitten obscure kind of place? Is that it's right? Yorkshire. <laughs> oh, God. It's, it's not Yorkshire. But, it, but, but you've got to think, think of, of Jesus as a northerner. Right. So, you know, all the apostles, Jesus and the apostles. Right. And Jerusalem is... You know, it's it's the southern metropolis, and it is in, it is administratively distinct. So that's the key thing. Okay. And according, you know, John has Jesus going to Jerusalem and Judea every so often, but in the other three gospels, so Mark, Matthew, and Luke, Jesus only goes to Judea when he goes to Jerusalem at the very end, which culminates in his death and in, in his arrest. So he spends death. all the rest of his time in Galilee. So the rest of the time he's in Galilee. So he's not surrounded by Romans. Nevertheless, obviously, Rome is a, a crucial part of the equation. And again, from Josephus, we can get a sense of how this is operating. So the prefect, it, it's a prefect up until, um, I think, AD 44, then it becomes a procurator. So Pilate is the prefect. Uh, he is based in Caesarea, um, a city that is named after Augustus. Yeah. And so th that is a kind of civic embodiment of Roman power. Um, he comes up to Jerusalem at the Passover when huge numbers of Judeans gather in Jerusalem for, for, for the Passover. And, and that's always a cause anxiety for the Roman authorities. So he's coming up with his, um, with his troops. He works in close alliance with the priestly party in Jerusalem, who are basically kind of very posh collaborators with Roman rule. Right. Um, and he has his military forces, again, are not legions. He does not have a legion. He has um, auxiliaries. So they're locals. And who are these are auxiliaries? Well, they are locals, but they don't seem to be Judean. So Julius Caesar had, um, had officially granted Judeans an exemption from, from conscription because of the whole problem that they would have to kind of pay worship to uh, legionary standards and so on. So the question is, where are these people being recruited from? And the evidence from Josephus is that they are basically what in the Gospels are called Samaritans. So people who are Jew-ish, they have similarities to Judean belief, but they're very hostile to the Judeans. And that's the whole point of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Right. And so these are the soldiers in due course who will whip Jesus and crucify him they're more likely to be Samaritan than they are Roman. And so that's a kind of dimension of the story that often yes. gets overlooked. Yes. So the Romans are, are there. And as I mentioned, you also have the high priests. And again, we, can, we know from Josephus that um, the high priest serves as the head of a council of priests, that it's his responsibility to call them. That's the Sanhedrin, is it? The Sanhedrin, that this council consists uh, of both of various groups of uh, Judeans who define themselves as Pharisees and Sadducees. Again, these appear in, in the Gospels. Um, and it's their instinct is to work very, very closely with the Roman governor as a way of basically keeping order because... This alliance from the point of view of the priests enables the temple to function and um, Jerusalem to become, you know, to, to flourish as this great center of Judean pilgrimage. The Romans keep the, the kind of the accoutrements of the high priest, which are only given to him at very, very kind of holy moments of the year. So when you say accoutrements, this is robes, 
the robes, the tiara, all that kind of stuff. Uh, only the high priest has authority to summon the council. And what Josephus does not tell us, and, and there is basically no consensus among modern scholars, is whether the high priest had the authority to put people to death. So the likelihood is, is that he had, he kind of had de facto right to put them to death, but he didn't have the kind of legal authority under Roman law to put them to death. But that, that tallies, doesn't it, with the story of Jesus? We're jumping ahead, but yes. the high priest basically goes to Pontius Pilate and Pilate does yeah. all his hand washing and says, fine, you know. Based on the evidence of, of Josephus, that seems to be the state of play. Right. So I think what you might say with reference to the Gospels is that in the Gospels, the macro detail is basically pretty correct. Yeah. So the micro details might be all over the place, but the macro context seems to be pretty accurate. And what's interesting about them is that Josephus writes as an admirer of the priestly class. He's, he is one of them. He, he respects them. He admires them, which is one of the reasons why Josephus is so happy to collaborate with the Romans. You know, he doesn't see it as being treacherous. He sees it as being sensible. That word collaborate, Tom, it's very loaded. I mean, it they, is would, a, it, yeah, it's, it, they would say, listen, the Romans are the big wigs. This is, it's mad to think about fighting them or something. I mean, why yeah. would we want to do that? And I think, we want to trade. We want to have stability. We yeah, want to have law and absolutely. order. Yeah. And, and I think on top of them, they would say that it's the will of God. God has given the empire of the world to the Romans. So, you know, let's go with it. That's, yeah. And that is absolutely Josephus's perspective. What's interesting is the point of view of the Gospels is different. The, the, the Gospels do not like the, the priestly authorities. Right. Well, I'm hoping we're going to get onto what the Gospels are in a little bit, because you've referred to them a lot, but we haven't really dug into who wrote them, where they come from. Before we come to them, there is one further source of evidence that is extraneous to the Gospels in the New Testament, and that's archaeology. And there's been a lot of, of uh, excavations done in, in Galilee over recent decades. And what they have shown is that the period when Jesus is living seems to be a, an age of escalating cultural tensions within Galilee. And this has been measured really fascinatingly by um, through pottery, Dominic. I know you love a pot. I love a pot, you? Tom. I love a pot. This is exactly what I expect from ancient history. So what happens over the course of the, of the first century BC is that in Galilee, you, you see the, the arrival of uh, Roman style cooking vessels, which are kind of shiny and red, uh, very fashionable in Italy, and therefore become fashionable in, out in the Roman provinces. And what happens around the time Jesus is born is that people who identify with basically Greek, you know, who, 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 who see themselves as belonging to the, the Greek world, they are buying up this Roman pottery. But in households that would identify as Judean, they start to consciously reject this. And so it's a bit of an extrapolation, but you might read from that the fact that this is a kind of an attempt to identify themselves very, very self-consciously as not a part of the Greek world. Yeah. And this is the world that Jesus is born into. This is the world of the villages that lie outside cities like Sepphoris. So Nazareth and Capernaum and all these places that are familiar to anyone who's read the Gospels. These are places where there seems to be a, a cultural repudiation of everything that Greek civilization represents. So a little bit of a culture war, Tom. A little bit of a culture metropolitan war. Metropolitan and non-metropolitan, urban and rural. Yeah. You know, uh, are you are you with the Romans and the Greeks or are you one of us? That kind of way yeah. of thinking. Yeah. Uh, so so what you have in Galilee and and what you definitely get in the Gospels is the sense of an alienation from the Greek world, but also a certain alienation from the world of Judea and the, and the temple, the priests. Because they've collaborated, presumably, is it? Or, they're, they're, or are they part of some city, no, I th big city world that people are rejecting? Well, again, to go back to the modern parallel, it's, it's L'Angleterre profonde and it's suspicion of London, that kind of thing. Yeah. There, there is a sense of alienation from the world of the capital, from the world of the temple priests, from the world That's of- That's me, Tom. I yeah. wouldn't have a Roman pot in the house. So you are a, you, you are a Galilean. And so yeah. this is the world that, that Jesus is born into, according to the Gospels. And it seems to me that the evidence from Josephus, the evidence from the archaeology, actually seems to, to uh, elucidate what the portrait that we have in the Gospels. Okay. We now come to the New Testament. Yes, and, come on, you know, finally. And, 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 and this is, I mean, this is basically why I've been so nervous about doing this episode, is that brilliant scholars study this stuff all their life. And 
you know, there is, as we said at the start of the episode, there is a huge kind of backlog of scholarly inquiry into this. Yeah. Centr- you know, for decades and decades and decades. That has never stopped us before, Tom. It has not. Um, and basically, so, so there's uh, the scholar Dale Allison. The frailty of human memory should distress all who quest for the so-called historical Jesus. So that's, that is basically the issue. The Gospels are written. We don't know when the Gospels are written exactly. Uh, the earliest is almost universally thought to be Mark. So it's um, Mark, or, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, but Mark is number one. Mark right? is generally thought to be number one. Um, generally dated to around 60. So that's about 30 years after the death of Jesus. Yeah. Matthew and Luke are conventionally dated to after the sack of Jerusalem. So that would be, uh, looking into the, into the seventies, perhaps. Yeah. Um, there are some who, who date that because there was, there are quite interesting correspondences between Luke and Josephus. So there are various kind of rebels against Roman rule that, that Josephus mentions that also appear in Luke's account. And so it has been argued that perhaps Luke is drawing on, uh, on, on Josephus's work, in which case Luke would be right at the end of the first century AD. Yeah. The alternative thesis would be that Luke is definitely a figure who's interested in the broader historical context. So you saw that in the reading that you had where he refers to Augustus. He refers like to that. the governor of Syria, all that kind of stuff. I like a lot of that. I like, I like that in Luke. It's my favorite gospel because it has a lot of historical detail. It does have a lot of historical detail. So it may be that he's just interested in, like Josephus, he's picking up all this kind, you know, all these various figures. So, and John is, is a much more theological, um, uh, uh, account. Um, so the three other gospels are called synoptic. They, they have this kind of same gaze, the same perspective. Um, John is seen as quite different, generally dated to end of the first century, beginning of the second century. Although there are scholars who actually think that it's very early, uh, and think that it was written by an eyewitness called John. Okay. But they're in the minority, right? I mean, well, there's a guy called Robert Baucom who's written um, a book called Jesus and the Eyewitnesses came out, I think, about 15 years ago. That has been, I mean, it's been very, it's had quite an influence. And in that, he argues that Mark, Mark's gospel really was written by a bloke called Mark. <laughs> and that essentially it's the record of Peter's, um, he's transcribing Peter's account. So Peter, the, uh, you know, the rock, uh, Jesus is chief apostle. And he also says that, that, uh, John, John's gospel is also an eyewitness account. Um, and it, it is at one end of a, a range of perspectives. Uh, the other would say that it's, it's everything is so garbled that we can't really know anything about it. And the problem with, um, arriving at a hard and fast conclusion about the dates of the gospels, where they came from, how they came to be written is that there is this range of, of, of kind of accepted scholarly opinion. Yeah. They were written by eyewitnesses, or at least Mark and John were written by eyewitnesses, or they were written at the end of the first century AD. And basically, we can know nothing at all about what Jesus said because of the, the, the effect of Chinese whispers. And, you know, that, that is basically where I think where we are. You, know, you have to be agnostic about it to a degree, I think, and say that ultimately we can't know. And there are a couple of things, though, on the Tom, that if I can just interject. One is that, um, you mentioned the, the Mark, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Synoptic Gospels. There are elements that, that match each other from those stories. So there are yeah. stories that recur, which might lead you to say, well, unless they are just copying each other, you know, you've got three sources telling you something. Generally in history, you would say, okay, well, that probably happened. The second thing is, isn't, am I not right in thinking that people who work on this say, where there are details that are kind of embarrassing for Christians or a bit yeah. weird or a bit obscure or you wouldn't make it up? they probably are true because if you wouldn't make right. it up and you put it in, so, then it's probably true. So again, this is, this is absolutely par for the course for anyone who works in the field of ancient history. So you, you've talked about Alexander. So you have exactly the same spectrum of opinion around Alexander. You have people who write biographies of Alexander, notable historians who live in the Cotswolds among them. <laughs> yeah, or Robin Lane Fox. Or, well, Robin Lane or, Fox or, or, yes. or Peter Green. I mean, who are very, very reputable classicists and they will write biographies of Alexander, drawing on the texts and saying, Alexander did this, he said that, whatever. And there are others who are so skeptical that they doubt that, you know, Alexander was ever taught by Aristotle or that, you know, we can say anything. We don't really know anything about Alexander at all, apart from the fact that he conquered the Persian Empire. Ultimately, it comes down to weighing and sifting the evidence, placing it in the broader context and kind of arriving at your own conclusion. The, the complication with Jesus, of course, is that the people who study the Gospels are either Christian 
or very militantly anti-Christian. Yeah. And so by and large, if you're Christian, you're going to essentially say, yeah, we can rely on this. And if you're militantly anti-Christian, you're going to say, no, it's all nonsense. I mean, I'm being unfair because there are absolutely examples of scholars who say so Bart Ehrman would be the classic example, someone who was a very devout Christian, went to study, um, you know, theological college, uh, studied all the, the, um, the question of the historical Jesus and ended up losing his faith and is now on the kind of the much more skeptical wing. Equally, you have, so Dale Allison, who I mentioned is a, is a Christian, but is quite you know, skeptical about quite a lot of the traditions mm. um, for reasons that are deeply rooted in, you know, an understanding of how history functions. So I don't want to, you know, my position of relative ignorance kind of sound like I'm, I'm sneering at it. I'm absolutely not. But I'm, I'm just saying that nobody thinks Alexander was a god. Nobody thinks Augustus was a god. But people do think Jesus is god. Yeah. And so therefore that does make it more complicated. But ultimately, it doesn't make it that much more complicated because what you have to do with all this stuff is to kind of weigh it up and say, well, what do you, what do you think? So I, I think in part two, that's what we should look at. We should, we should say, well, you know, we've looked at the mystery. Can we get to the history? So we've got Josephus, we've got Tacitus, we've got the archaeology. We have the context of the Roman world and the world of Galilee and Judea. And we have these four gospels. Plus there are also other things, aren't there? There are kind of apocryphal gospels and things. Well, I think, okay, so, so that's an interesting point. So you talked about how uh, this tradition of looking at Jesus as a historical figure is basically a, enlightenment and post-enlightenment. But I think actually that's not entirely true because the early Christians themselves were aware that there were, you know, all kinds of gospels. And by the middle of the second century, they're starting to wake up to the fact that some of these gospels are less reliable than others. And the reason why we have the four gospels in what comes to be the New Testament and why they come to be seen as canonical is because there are so many other gospels that um, people who define themselves as orthodox, and the guy who does this is a man called Irenaeus, is the guy who basically starts to construct the idea of the canon that will emerge as the New Testament. And his basis for deciding on which gospels you know, our gospel, if you want to put it like yeah. that, is that they're the earliest and that they're the most reliable. So he is applying historical methodology right. to this question. Yeah. And he's saying these four are the, are the reliable ones. And that's why the other gospels are cast aside. It's not because of some conspiracy involving Mary Magdalene or, you know, the bloodline of Christ or anything like that. It's because they are, they are weighed and quite correctly seem to be less accurate. Okay. They're later, they're kind of, they preserve all kinds of garbled traditions. And more importantly, they are not rooted in the fabric and the historical depth of first century AD Palestine. And what I would say is that the best way for, for I think, for understanding Jesus is that he is seen by his contemporaries as a very, very strange figure. His strangeness is not just because of, you know, the back projection of 2000 years of seeing him as a God. He's clearly seen by his contemporaries, both Judean and Roman as strange. And that's because I think he, he comes from this Galilean context in which there is hostility to the temple authorities. Galileans are regarded with a measure of contempt by the Judeans. So in John, you have this, this phrase, no prophet will ever arise in Galilee. So that's a kind of an expression of how Galileans are are looked down upon by the temple authorities. Right. That's your Yorkshire parallel, Tom. But you also have this hostility to the claims to power and authority of the Greeks and the Romans. And Jesus is very, very hard-headed in his analysis of how Greek civilization works. So he refers to, you know, the, the Greek cities, when we go to a Greek city, it, you know, we think how beautiful it is, all these arches, these libraries, all this kind of stuff. Jesus is absolutely merciless in his analysis of this. He says that the, the great figures, Hoi Megaloi, in these cities and, and these projects of kind of civic benefactions are, are scams. They are ways for the great to, to, to flaunt their power and their wealth and that, that true greatness is not to be great. And so there's a kind of paradoxical undermining of the whole fabric of, of Greek and Roman assumptions there. And I think that it's, it's the fact that he is between, he, he rejects both the temple of Jerusalem yep. and the gods and the kind of civic assumptions of Greece and Rome that make him so strange and that in the long run lead to his death. Okay. So and, Tom and that I think is where you situate 
if you want to call it the historical Jesus, the yeah. historical Jesus. I, I led you down a massive new tangent then. You were just, I was thinking to myself, we're going to have a break now and you and I can go and have coffee. <laughs> yeah, sorry, then, sorry. But, so I, I started you off with the apocryphal gospels, which I shouldn't have done. However, so next time on The Rest is History, we will be trying to put together a life of Jesus uh, based on these sources. Um, now, if you can't wait, you could, of course, join The Rest is History Club. And you would be able to listen to that episode straight away. Now, I'm not going to say to you that that's what Jesus would have wanted, but it's what I want you to do. And I think that's what you should be thinking of. Perhaps Jesus would have wanted maybe a loved one to get you an early Christmas present. <laughs> you certainly would, Tom. <laughs> of that, there is no doubt. So on that bombshell, we say goodbye for the moment. If you're in the rest of History Club, we will see you or you will hear us rather in a couple of minutes. If not, you'll have to wait a few days and uh, goodbye. Bye bye. 